Welcome back, everyone, to the final read-through episode for Book 2 of The Gay Science. After we conclude today, we will return to the regular episodes of Season 5, although, as I mentioned, I want to do a Wandering Above a Sea of Fog-style episode after this, and then I think we'll, t- we'll have a week break as well. Um, it's just, again, something I need for preparation, research, and things of that nature. So, uh, these last aphorisms of Book 2 uh, continue the meditations on art and culture, So without further ado, we'll jump right into 98. Quote, In praise of Shakespeare, I could not say anything more beautiful in praise of Shakespeare as a human being than this. He believed in Brutus and did not cast one speck of suspicion upon this type of virtue. It was to him that he devoted his best tragedy. It is still called by the wrong name. To him and to the most awesome quintessence of a lofty morality. Independence of the soul, that is at stake here. No sacrifice can be too great for that. One must be capable of sacrificing one's dearest friend for it, even if he should also be the most glorious human being, an ornament of the world, a genius without peer. If one loves freedom as the freedom of great souls, and he threatens this kind of freedom. That is what Shakespeare must have felt. The height at which he places Caesar is the finest honor that he could bestow on Brutus. That is how he raises beyond measure Brutus's inner problem, as well as the spiritual strength that was able to cut this knot. Could it really have been political freedom that led this poet to sympathize with Brutus and turned him into Brutus's accomplice? Or was political freedom only a symbol for something inexpressible? Could it be that we confront some unknown dark event and adventure in the poet's own soul of which he wants to speak only in signs? What is all of Hamlet's melancholy compared to that of Brutus? And perhaps Shakespeare knew both, from first-hand experience. Perhaps he too had his gloomy hour and his evil angel, like Brutus. But whatever similarities and secret relationships there may have been, before the whole figure and virtue of Brutus, Shakespeare prostrated himself, feeling unworthy and remote. His witness of this is written into the tragedy. Twice he brings in a poet, and twice he pours such an impatient and ultimate contempt over him that it sounds like a cry, a cry of self-contempt. Brutus, even Brutus, loses patience as the poet enters, conceited, pompous, obtrusive, as poets often are, apparently overflowing with possibilities of greatness, including moral greatness, although in the philosophy of his deeds and his life, he rarely attains even ordinary integrity. I'll know his humor when he knows his time. What should the wars do with these jiggling fools? Companion, hence, shouts Brutus. This should be translated back into the soul of the poet who wrote it. End quote. So, beginning with this section here, it's very fitting for these last uh, ruminations on Book 2, since much of what Nietzsche will have to say in the latter passages of Book 2 concerns the Germans, both specific Germans and Germans in general. And this involves Nietzsche's own emancipation from the ideology of Wagner and from the philosophy of Schopenhauer. Now, in this passage concerning Shakespeare, Nietzsche discusses the tragedy of Julius Caesar, which is where he sees the basis of Shakespeare's greatness. The fact that Brutus was willing to sacrifice his friendship with Caesar, to participate in the murder of his mentor and, frankly, his father figure, someone very, very dear to him, as dear to him as anyone could be. Uh, And the greater that Caesar is made out to be in the play, the more impressive is Brutus's willingness to assassinate him. And so it's the fact that Brutus is willing to kill someone dear to him to to effectively kill a part of himself in order to secure his freedom. This is the greatness of Brutus, and in this way we can perceive the greatness of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's understanding of what it takes, what it really takes, to secure your independence, um, a spiritual independence, and the high cost that one has to pay, the almost unthinkable sacrifice that one has to make. Nietzsche has effectively done the same thing for the sake of his own independence of spirit by rejecting Wagner, Schopenhauer, basically everything that anchored him previously. And that not only plays out um, in his life, but also in the next passages, as I mentioned, in which Nietzsche discusses this. And even his critique of the Germans in general is somewhat in the same flavor, because of course here he speaks of political freedom as only a symbol for something inexpressible. And in the same way, Nietzsche's critique of the Germans isn't just an assertion of a political opinion bounded to the geopolitics of Nietzsche's time and and place, but an expression of his freedom from any such national claim on who he is, independence from being conscripted into anyone else's 
uh, political or national project. And I think that's the implication of much of Nietzsche's critique of the Germans. His hostility towards his own fatherland, um, a, a lot of that comes out of that need for independence, securing one's independence through critique or attack. And uh, so, as he says elsewhere, Nietzsche wishes to be known as the hater of the Germans par excellence, but that's for a very creative reason. It's for a very constructive reason, a self-creative reason. But uh, in any case, we'll discuss the actual content of Passage 98 in a bit more depth, not just the, the broader implications. Uh, one of Nietzsche's other comments in 98 is, what is all of Hamlet's melancholy compared to that of Brutus? So let's compare the two. I mean, Hamlet is a man full of doubt, but who must act? And this is perhaps a very relatable main character, um, especially for modern audiences. But that's just the thing. Hamlet's so relatable because his melancholy is so common. Hamlet perfectly captures the plight of the modern man. In spite of being a prince, an aristocrat himself, um, but as Nietzsche puts it in Birth of Tragedy, he writes there, knowledge kills action. And that's the real underlying tragic idea of Hamlet, not the cheap dilemma of Jack the Dreamer who simply reflects too much and can't ever get around to acting. Rather, following some of the sentiments of Goethe, you know, found in his conversations and in his maxims, Nietzsche comes to this position that knowledge itself, the truth itself, uh, that is what paralyzes and torments. It's the moment of Hamlet holding up the skull of Yorick, saying to Horatio, I knew him. That's the fatal truth that paralyzes Hamlet. The truth that he knows from the moment of seeing his father's apparition, knowing what his father's apparition commands of him. Hamlet's indecision, his doubt, is not the doubt of a rational skeptic, or like we'll say his doubt is not like analysis paralysis, as we would say in modern times. That's Nietzsche's interpretation anyway. Uh, in Birth of Tragedy, that Hamlet's real problem is that he knows exactly what the truth is from the moment the specter of his father tells him something is rotten in the state of Denmark. It's his self-consciousness of where that course leads and his inability to marshal his will given that knowledge, the way that that knowledge has killed his capacity for action, that the almost kind of Schopenhauerian perception of the futility of his position the meaningless self-perpetuating violence of the human condition, the role that he's been cast into that uh, Hamlet is sort of thrown into that he must play in all of this due to circumstances which have always been out of his control. You know, the, the facts of Hamlet's birth and uh, his position in society. So that's what torments Hamlet. He knows what he has to do um, and he cannot summon the will to do it basically. But in any case, the defining feature of Hamlet is reluctance and being undone by this consciousness of the truth. That's the position of the modern person who is self-conscious of who and what they are in relation to broader society and who is hindered in acting by that self-consciousness. Uh, on some level, this is not even a problem with modern civilization, quote unquote, but civilization in general. I mean, we might recall Nietzsche's comments on forgetting in the process of civilizing human beings, that this was really a process of carving away some space from the power of forgetting, which is an active and positive force, in order to make room for remembering. And this was necessary so that people could keep their promises. Without the right to make promises, there's no society, there's no civilization. The eternal problem with this is that forgetting facilitates action, whereas memory is, well, it, it, it's useful in and of itself, but it's prone to pathologies in which action is hindered. Uh, all of this is to say that by the mere fact of holding onto past sense impressions and feelings, we can develop all sorts of psychological problems that disrupts our capacity for action. So that's the position of Hamlet in some sense. It's a powerful play because it speaks to the plight of modern man who is a product of civilization. He's the most, um, he's the furthest along in this process of civilization trying to improve mankind. But Nietzsche says, what is all of that compared with Brutus? Because Brutus is a truly tragic figure in the classical sense. His personal tragedy is something so heightened, so extreme, that the average person actually can't self-identify with it, or, or probably can't. I mean, who among us has ever been put into the position of killing someone who is like a father to you as, as a sacrifice for the greater good of your republic or whatever it might be because of a higher value or ideal that you believe in how many of us if we were tested in that way would actually make that sacrifice so nietzsche references brutus's gloomy hour and evil angel so the the apparition of caesar 
who prophesies us to Brutus that he shall meet his doom in battle. And so the tragic nature of his story, of Brutus's story, is that he sacrifices his father figure in the pursuit of independence, which I suppose he receives. But part of the cost of that bargain is his own death and that he shall plunge the city into a civil war. Um, you know, the, he brings on his own death because in that civil war, powerful men who are the allies of Caesar will seek to kill Brutus. But I think, hmm, it, yes, it is to avenge Caesar, but more importantly, they kill Brutus and Cassius as a, just a direct result of the struggle for power that's created by Caesar's death. The, the opportunism of Augustus and Antony, which is, is even shown in the dialogue of, of Shakespeare's play, I think there's the scene where they're already sort of, you know, they're setting up the, the first tri- or the second triumvirate and uh, Antony and Augustus are already sort of talking about how they can cut Lepidus out of the bargain, right? So these men don't necessarily avenge Caesar's death out of virtue. Brutus has played a role in, in releasing these demons, opening up this anarchistic competition that necessitates destroying all of the old guard, all of the aristocracy that took up arms or, or that participated in political action or, or in these assassinations and so on. And so Brutus and Cassius act in the name of political independence, at least ostensibly. But we see, even over the course of Shakespeare's tragedy, um, which does not even cover that long of a period of time, but as we know from history, um, this doesn't lead to, doesn't, it doesn't result in a new era of liberty. It results in civil war, and as we know from history, it eventually leads to autocracy. So, you know, he does, the political independence, in, independence is not uh, achieved, is my point here. So what then is the real meaning of Brutus's act? The only significance it can have in the final analysis is that it was an act of emancipation for Brutus, the kind of emancipatory act that many of us can scarcely dream of, to become truly liberated from a father figure, by violence if necessary, because that father figure, however admirable and impressive and heroic he may be, threatens the deepest values, the highest ideals of Brutus. And that's why there seems to be a clear parallel between Nietzsche and Wagner, a man who is also like the relationship with Brutus and Caesar, Wagner is not Nietzsche's father, but a close friend and mentor, and he becomes something of a father figure, whom Nietzsche feels he must also, quote-unquote, sacrifice, although in this case, that just means cut off all of his ties of friendship, right, and attack Wagner in a literary sense, you know. Um, He he doesn't stab uh, Wagner on the the floor of his Festspielhaus, uh, with a bunch of other philosophers saying six semper tyrannis, he stabs him with words, he needles him with maxims and missiles, right? So, uh, you know, uh, making, drawing the, and, and to be in fairness to Nietzsche, he's not drawing this comparison himself, I'm drawing it, so uh, maybe I, I'm the one doing a bit of exaggerating here. But um, Wagner ultimately goes against Nietzsche's highest values in many ways. We've gone over all this before in the podcast, but their disagreement was not just personal, but it was political, it was spiritual, it was moral. I mean, really, the only daylight remaining between them was aesthetic. Um, it, it should be said. That's why Nietzsche still had tender words for Wagner even long after their break, because aesthetics are a big deal to Nietzsche. But eventually, he even criticizes him on this basis. Uh, and in any case, the parallels are clear in this passage. And it's fascinating that Nietzsche finds the greatness of Shakespeare precisely at the place where Shakespeare dramatizes a story in which you can see a clear parallel to Nietzsche's own life. Uh, The final remarks, um, well, we have more jabs at the poets. Nietzsche's been doing that throughout this section. And to be honest, I think we've gotten the point across about Nietzsche's uh, complex relationship with poetry. But it is interesting, he also sees that in Shakespeare, right? It's not just more taking jabs at the poets. He's pointing at the very paradox at the heart of that relationship. The poet or well, the playwright in the case of Shakespeare. But Shakespearean dialogue is pretty much poetry, right? I mean, it, uh, it, it, it's verse, it's iambic pentameter. It rhymes a lot of the time, but Shakespeare weaves into the story a distrust of poets, just as Homer does in his Odyssey, just as Nietzsche does in his Zarathustra, right? So 
Shakespeare's understanding of the mendacity of poets is perhaps another part of his greatness from Nietzsche's perspective, because it's another thing he shares with Nietzsche, and from Nietzsche's perspective that perhaps all great poets share, they understand many lies tell the poets, and we can see that even in, in Shakespeare's work. And so those are the main reasons why Nietzsche thinks Shakespeare has uh, achieved greatness. And uh, more than anything, it's just interesting to consider the comparison from, from my perspective, the comparison between Brutus and Hamlet and the comparison between Brutus and Nietzsche, uh, or at least symbolically the connection, right? All right, uh, let's go to number 99, entitled Schopenhauer's Followers. And this is a very long and complicated passage, but it's very, very important as regards Nietzsche's understanding of Schopenhauer. Um, and we've covered that extensively also in the podcast, but there's always more to talk about. So we'll take this one in chunks. Uh, Quote, what happens when barbarians come into contact with a higher culture? The lower culture always accepts, first of all, the vices, weaknesses, and excesses, and only then, on that basis, finds a certain attraction in the higher culture, and eventually, by the way of the vices and weaknesses that it has acquired, also accepts some of the overflow of what really has value. That can also be observed nearby, without traveling to remote barbarian tribes. Of course, what we see near us is somewhat refined and spiritualized and not quite so palpable. What do Schopenhauer's German followers gen generally accept, first of all, from their master? In comparison with his superior culture, they must surely feel barbarous enough to be initially fascinated and seduced by him like barbarians. Is it his sense for hard facts, his goodwill for clarity and reason, which so often makes him appear so English and un-German? or the strength of his intellectual conscience that endured a lifelong contradiction between being and willing, and also compelled him to contradict himself continually in his writings on almost every point, or his cleanliness in questions about the church and the Christian God, for here his cleanliness was quite unprecedented among German philosophers, and he lived and died, quote, as a Voltairian, or his immortal doctrines of the intellectuality of intuition, of the a priori nature of the causal law, of the instrumental character of the intellect, and the unfreedom of the will. No, none of this enchants his German followers. They do not find it enchanting at all. End quote. Okay, so the beginning of the passage. When barbarians come into contact with a more complex, advanced society, the first thing they receive from it is vi it, the vices of that more complex society. And this is a stereotype, I mean, but it is a no it's a known phenomenon, to be honest. Um, you know, the introduction of hard liquor to the Native Americans was disastrous for them. Uh, apparently the same thing happened with the Gauls uh, that became part of the Imperium Romanum. You know, Roman wine was, was absolutely devastating on their physiology. Uh, we can set aside whether this is like a, uh, what might we say, a real phenomenon or not, or like these designations of higher and lower cultures. The whole point of why Nietzsche brings this up, let's let's use the metaphor in the terms he's using it, right? He's trying to make a point about uh, the Germans, who are in this passage cast as the barbaric people. <laughs> so however offensive it might be, uh, if you think, you know, Nietzsche is calling the Native Americans a lower culture or whatever, I mean, he's basically, he's calling the Germans a lower culture as well. And so that's Nietzsche's common ref refrain on the Germans. And Schopenhauer, although a German himself, is standing there for the more... Uh, developed, the more civilized man. And what they take from him first, what the German culture takes from this thinker, are his vices, not his virtues. So now Nietzsche, for most of the passage we've read so far, is reading out a list of Schopenhauer's virtues um, up to the point where we ended, that he was cleanly when dealing with matters of Christianity and the church. What does that mean? No solemn reverence, no sense of piety, no seduction to lose himself in the um, in the mysticism of Christian doctrine and not to be satisfied with like a holy mystery or something like that. That is what it means to live his whole life as a Voltarian, as an eternal critic of the church. What else is admirable about Schopenhauer? Uh, surprisingly, perhaps, uh, surprising when we consider who is saying this, his almost English commitment to the facts, a hard-nosed attitude about objectivity. And perhaps most interestingly, the desire to never run from the eternal contradiction of being and willing. And what does that mean? Well, Kaufman interprets this as Schopenhauer not measuring up to his own standards, um, that Schopenhauer has this ideal for negation of the will, but um, 
obviously Schopenhauer is not an ascetic himself. Um, and so we, we might say that Schopenhauer refused to adjust his will uh, to the con- actual conditions of his life, to his actual being, to say, no, my will is directed at something which is beyond my being as it is constituted now, that I desire to be more than I am, even if I find myself a creature with no self-control, with no discipline, with no mastery over my impulses, I still will to become somebody who has those qualities, even if I'm not. Uh, that, that's I, what I think gets at the the contradiction between willing and being, at least in Kaufman's reading. And so this perception of a transcendent quality of the will, of the element of becoming in the will, the willingness to endure the contradiction, the strength to endure the contradiction between what one wills and what one actually is, and not to settle into one's being and stop desiring for becoming. That's Schopenhauer's war upon his own happiness, as Nietzsche um, once put it in his Untimely Meditations. And this is paired, perhaps, strangely enough, with the rejection of freedom of the will. Uh, and for what it's worth, again, we can recognize Nietzsche in all of these aspects of Schopenhauer's thought. So this passage is very helpful because Nietzsche is saying, look, this is the good of Schopenhauer, the virtue of Schopenhauer. In other words, this is what I took from Schopenhauer. This is where I see the value in Schopenhauer's thought. This is precisely what the Germans do not take from him. All the aspects of Schopenhauer's thought uh, that Nietzsche uh, would say are the most virtuous, the most cleanly, these more or less fall by the wayside in comparison to his true effect on German culture. So again, like barbarians, they take the worst aspect of Schopenhauer, they take his vices. And that's Nietzsche's attempt, perhaps, at explaining how a figure like Schopenhauer, that he's elsewhere called heroic, and that he has um, acknowledged as a great teacher and as an influence, could have such a disastrous effect on society. Because the great many do not ever comprehend or perceive the whole man. Right, we're, we're always um, picking and choosing, or emphasizing or de-emphasizing certain things. And overall, we seek out the beliefs of someone that we want to adopt uh, on the basis of what makes us happy, or um, what clicks with what we already believe. And the majority tend to find in a human being, uh, in a philosopher, only those ideas that can be adapted to suit the needs of the majority, or of just the needs of society, particularly the moral needs. So uh, with that, let's return to the passage where Nietzsche then lists off the vices of Schopenhauer, so to speak, all of the places where Schopenhauer has, unfortunately, become influential. Quote, uh, No, none of this enchants his German followers. They do not find it enchanting at all. But Schopenhauer's mystical embarrassments and subterfuges in those places, where the factual thinker allowed himself to be seduced and corrupted by the vain urge to be the unriddler of the world, the unprovable doctrine of the one will, quote, all causes are merely occasional causes of the appearance of the will at this time and at this place, end quote, and, quote, the will to life is present, whole and undivided in every being, including the least, as completely as in all beings that ever have been, are, and shall be, if they were all taken together, end quote. The denial of the individual, Quote, all lions are at bottom only one lion, end quote. And, quote, the plurality of individuals is mere appearance, end quote. Even as development is mere appearance, he calls Lamarck's idea an ingenious but absurd error. His ecstatic reveries about genius, quote, in aesthetic contemplation, the individual is no longer an individual, but the pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge, end quote. And, quote, as the subject is wholly absorbed in the object that it contemplates, it becomes this object itself, end quote. The nonsense about pity and how it makes possible a breakthrough, the principium individuationis, and how this is the source of all morality. Also such claims as, quote, dying is really the purpose of existence, end quote. And, quote, a priori, one cannot altogether deny the possibility that magical effects might emanate from one who has died, end quote. These and other such excesses and vices of the philosopher are always accepted first of all and turned into articles of faith, for vices and excesses are always aped most easily and require no long training, end quote. So that's why it's easier to accept the vices. Makes perfect sense. At least the reasoning's internally sound. And uh, sorry, I, I hope it wasn't hard to sort of read along with me there, but there's lots of Nietzsche quoting straight from the text of Schopenhauer to make his point. It's actually one of the most rigorous passages in Nietzsche, even though, of course, he offers no citations, because why would he? He's Nietzsche. But um, as far as just direct quotations from Schopenhauer, from World as Well and Representation, and from his aphorisms and essays, uh, this 
uh, particular passage in Nietzsche is uh, just uh, rife with um, quotations to back up his point. So where Schopenhauer loses value and becomes a source of sickness is precisely where Germany adopts Schopenhauer, where he turns our attention to the world beyond by attempting to cognize the noumenal, to give an explanation, an ontological explanation for what everything in the world is or for what being itself is. And this explanation is monistic. It's that all phenomena are actually expressions of will. Schopenhauer then elucidates an idea of the gradations of the will akin to the platonic forms. He, he makes a direct comparison there. The idea behind this notion that all lions are fundamentally one lion is based on this, that the phenomenal experience of a lion is not the experience of some objective, essentialized reality, uh, but simply a type of expression of the world's will, and that the various iterations of that phenomena are not really that different from one another. The only animal whose individual members constitute their own gradation of the will are human beings, for Schopenhauer. But all the same, this is platonic categorical thinking, which is not surprising given the platonic influence on Schopenhauer's philosophy. And that's hand in hand with Schopenhauer's dismissal of evolution. And this particularly earns Nietzsche's ire because Nietzsche was influenced by Lamarck. And then finally, uh, Schopenhauer's view of genius. Again, influential on Nietzsche, uh, but Nietzsche from the, from the beginning sort of always... Uh, he criticized Schopenhauer on this. Uh, his, his his view, uh, Nietzsche believes that he was that Schopenhauer was misunderstanding or confusing the relationship between art and will, because Schopenhauer thinks of art purely within the terms of representation. So that means he doesn't really comprehend the Dionysian, and to put it in so many words, so he thinks the artistic genius loses himself, loses his individual will and becomes absorbed into the artistic object, the representation. That's Schopenhauer's view of genius. Uh, the, the artist becomes the willless subject of knowing. So art for Schopenhauer is this exercise of the intellect. It's an exercise in getting beyond the will by means of representation. That's the inner meaning of art in a way. And that's the complete inversion of Nietzsche's uh, view or understanding of genius, who, by experiencing the Dionysian, becomes totally absorbed in his uh, impulses and the physiological reality at the root of his existence. Now, obviously, Nietzsche tries to account for, for both types of art, representational and um, more Dionysian forms of art, by invoking both Apollo and Dionysus. But I think later Nietzsche would have said that all art involves some degree of both, and that without the Dionysian, without the vital life force involved in the artistic process, actual communion with one's feelings, one's drives. That's who you really are. The unconscious um, physiological root of yourself is who you really are. If you don't have that communion, you don't really have a complete art. Uh, the Schopenhauerian view of art is a philosopher's view of art. It's an intellectualized view of art. It takes the aesthetic work involved in art up into the metaphysical clouds, we might say. And so it is metaphysical leaps of Schopenhauer like these, these flights of fancy into the doctrine of the undivided will, the possibility of denial of the will through aesthetic contemplation, the reduction of all the material world into a platonic realm of uh, gradations of the will. That's what the Germans have adopted. They've adopted the worst vices of Schopenhauer's philosophy, which is to say his metaphysics. What Schopenhauer's character represented his full character, the full figure of Schopenhauer, the Germans have failed to understand or to really integrate into the culture. Schopenhauer's hard-nosed objectivity and his will not to be swept away by Christian sentimentality, his heroic war upon happiness, the uh, willingness to endure the self-contradiction between willing and being, that's what should be emulated. But instead, uh, it's what Nietzsche would see as Schopenhauer's weakness, his temptation to seek for salvation in an imagined world beyond. And the, the most damning quote is that dying is actually the point of existence. Uh, that is sort of where Schopenhauer comes to, the denial of the will to live. That's ultimately what is meant. Going into nothingness, the desire to no longer create these representations, to no longer live in a phenomenal world. But what lies beyond that? Well, Schopenhauer says it's nothing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll move on with the passage where... Uh, in the next sort of section, Nietzsche discusses Wagner. Quote, But let us discuss the most famous, famous living philosopher of Schopenhauer, Richard Wagner. What happened to him has happened to many artists. He misinterpreted the characters that he himself had created and misunderstood the philosophy that was implicit in his most characteristic works of art. 
until the middle of his life, Richard Wagner allowed himself to be led astray by Hegel. Later, the same thing happened to him a second time when he began to read Schopenhauer's doctrine into his characters and to apply himself, sorry, to apply to himself such categories as will, genius, and pity. Nevertheless, it will remain true that nothing could be more contrary to the spirit of Schopenhauer than what is distinctly Wagnerian and Wagner's heroes. I mean the innocence of the utmost selfishness, the faith and great passion as the good in itself, in one word, what is Siegfried-like in the countenance of his heroes. All this smells more even of Spinoza than it does of me, Schopenhauer himself might say. Although Wagner would have good reasons to look for some other philosopher rather than Schopenhauer, the spell that this thinker has cast over him has blinded him, not only to all other philosophies, but even to science itself. More and more, his whole art wants to present itself as a companion piece and supplement to Schopenhauer's philosophy, and more and more explicitly it renounces the loftier ambition of becoming a companion piece and supplement to human knowledge and science. Nor is it only the whole mysterious pomp of his philosophy, which would also have attracted a cagliostro, but the gestures and passions of the philosophers have always been seductive too. Wagner is Schopenhauerian, for example, in his exasperation over the corruption of the German language. And if one should applaud his imitation at this point, it should not be overlooked that Wagner's own style suffers rather heavily from all the ulcers and swellings whose sight enraged Schopenhauer. And as for the Wagnerians who write German, Wagnerism is beginning to prove as dangerous as any Hegelisms ever did. Wagner is Schopenhauerian in his hatred of the Jews, to whom he is not able to do, to do justice even when it comes to their greatest deed. After all, the Jews are the inventors of Christianity. Wagner is Schopenhauerian in his attempts to understand Christianity as a seed of Buddhism that has been carried far away by the wind and to prepare a Buddhistic epoch in Europe with an occasional rapprochement with Catholic Christian formulas and sentiments. Wagner is Schopenhauerian when he preaches mercy in our relations with animals. As we know, Schopenhauer's predecessor at this point was Voltaire, who may already have mastered the art that we encounter among his successors, to dress up his hatred against certain things and people as mercy for animals. At least Wagner's hatred of science, which finds expression in his preachment, is certainly not only inspired by any kind, sorry, any spirit of kindness, heartedness and benignity, nor indeed, as is obvious, by anything meriting the name of spirit. End quote. So, there's not as much to say about this. Well, maybe on the last point, I've heard that Wagner, when he later became a vegetarian, um, had very anti-Semitic reasons uh, for becoming vegetarian, something having to do with um, the Jewish people being the first cannibals or something like that. I don't know. I, I heard this from my friend Andre a, a long time ago. I believe we brought it up in the episode, the first interview I ever did with him, um, which you can find way back in the history of the podcast. I'm not exactly sure where, but... Um, just th that might help demystify Nietzsche's remark that Wagner's um, uh, hatred for someone else might be, be being covered over by a love for animals with his vegetarianism, because his vegetarianism might have been rooted in some weird, superstitious, anti-Semitic beliefs. But um, so the fact that Wagner was a Schopenhauerian was common knowledge, and yet Nietzsche still almost feels the need to prove he's a Schopenhauerian. That's sort of like the, the structure of the part of this passage we just read, right? It's almost like he's reading off a list of charges against him. He's Schopenhauerian because of this. He's Schopenhauerian because of that. Why does he feel the need to prove it? Well, because it's very important, uh, based on the way Nietzsche has prefaced this entire passage, that he show the way in which Wagner is a Schopenhauerian, not merely identify him as one, right? Because, as he said... Schopenhauer has his vices and he has his virtues. So is Wagner Schopenhauerian? Just saying he's Schopenhauerian isn't really uh, a damning criticism because in many ways Nietzsche is Schopenhauerian. If, if we, uh, what would we say? Following from the fact that Nietzsche has adopted all the virtues of Schopenhauer as he puts them. In that sense, he's a Schopenhauerian, right? He, he's at the very least, he's a former Schopenhauerian and believes that his engagement with Schopenhauer's philosophy allowed him to... Um, you know, he had to move beyond it, but that was a very useful thing for him to uh, experience and sort of interface with his thought. So it's very important that he shows the way in which Wagner is Schopenhauerian, not just to make the point that he is. So all of the things that he says about Wagner's Schopenhauerianism, are it's important, the things that he points out. Uh, the other aspect of this is that 
most of what Nietzsche says about Wagner can be applied to the broader social movement in Germany, of which Wagnerianism was only sort of like one broader part. And we all know the ugly place that all of this led a few decades later, but Nietzsche lists it off here. Anti-Semitism, Christianity, but with a kind of syncretic tendency, especially as regards Eastern religions, uh, and a desire to sort of separate Christianity from Judaism, and finally vegetarianism. I mean, all, all of these things apply to Wagner. They also apply to one of Wagner's biggest fans who came to power in the 1930s. It's funny because uh, people like to blame Nietzsche for the Nazis, but you know, here, about 40 years before that, that party even existed, Nietzsche is saying Schopenhauer is to blame, <laughs> right? Indirectly, right? Uh, of course, it's, yet again, it's not really Schopenhauer, if that makes sense. There's always an interaction between the text and the reader, the art and the interpretation. And one of the things that Nietzsche brought up at the beginning here is simply the reality that the rule for human beings is that we read badly, we interpret badly, we project ourselves into the stories of other peoples, other times and places, we take what we find palatable and we discard what we don't. We take complete individuals and we compress them and we crumple them or flatten them down into a two-dimensional picture. And we make them into something that suits our own necessities and has very little to do with who that person actually is. So um, let's finish out the passage. Quote, Of course, the philosophy of an artist does not matter much if it is merely an afterthought and does not harm his art. One cannot be too careful to avoid bearing any artist a grudge for an occasional, perhaps very unfortunate and presumptuous masquerade. We should not forget that without exception, our dear artists are, and have to be, to some extent, actors. And without play acting, they would scarcely endure life for any length of time. Let us remain faithful to Wagner in what is true and authentic in him, and especially in this, that we, as his disciples, remain faithful to ourselves in what is true and authentic in us, let him have his intellectual tempers and cramps. Let us, in all fairness, ask what strange nourishments and needs an art like this may require to be able to live and grow. It does not matter that as a thinker he is so often in the wrong. Justice and patience are not for him. Enough that his life is justified before itself and remains justified. This life which shouts at every one of us, Be a man and do not follow me. But yourself, but yourself. Our life, too, shall remain justified in our own eyes. We too shall grow and blossom out of ourselves, free and fearless in innocent selfishness. And as I contemplate such a human being, these sentences still come to my mind today as formerly. Quote, that passion is better than stoicism and hypocrisy. That being honest and evil is still better than losing oneself to the morality of tradition. That a free human being can be good as well as evil, but that the unfree human being is a blemish upon nature and has no share in any heavenly or earthly comfort. Finally, that everyone who wishes to become free must become free through his own endeavor, and that freedom does not fall into any man's lap as a miraculous gift. End quote. So I love the way the, the passage ends, um, and that's a direct quote from Richard Wagner and Bayreuth, uh, that Nietzsche is quoting himself at the end there. But uh, first, a few comments about what he says leading up to that uh, ending. So for one, Nietzsche compares Wagner to an actor. He says that all great artists have to be actors, and we should remember this. That's a sentiment he expressed earlier in the book about artists, or I believe it was about public-facing people in general, and I made the comparison to Wagner there as well. Next, Nietzsche refers to we, the disciples of Wagner, implying that he still considers himself one of them, using we in that sense. Does he actually, or is this a rhetorical flourish? Difficult to say, but um, especially given how self-aware Nietzsche is about his use of rhetoric, it's very likely that I would say I think that's just a rhetorical flourish. But the quotation, uh, be a man and don't follow me, that's from Goethe's post note to the sorrows of young Werther. And uh, if we remember, that book ends in a suicide, and it was said to have caused a number of suicides among the youth. Uh, it's a novel about a tortured romance and love triangle. It's supposed to reflect the, the storm and stress of youth, the Sturm und Drang. I mean, that's the very name of the genre of the novel. So Goethe wished to impart to his readers in s subsequent editions, after the book attained this, this air of danger, be a man and don't follow me. So Werther is a cautionary tale. It's a reframing. He's a tragic figure. Don't emulate him. The story is supposed to make you transcend Werther, not emulate him. And so again, we can compare this to the end of Zarathustra, uh, book one. Lose me, and in losing me, you may find me again. 
A pupil repays his teacher badly if he remains only a student. The point of having an inspiring teacher in your life is so that you can get beyond them. So whether this is merely rhetorical or otherwise, it's like Nietzsche is calling out to the other Wagnerians, or potential Wagnerians, almost as if to say, don't follow this man. Um, all, all the more so if you love him and idolize him for his music, in order for his art to grow and develop and flourish, we can't allow his art to be hindered by the personality of the mere actor making it. You repay Wagner best by getting beyond Wagner. And so he quotes from his own Untimely Meditations, the one on Richard Wagner, the last complete meditation to be published, and it's a call for independence, a kind of spiritual independence, freedom of the soul, the kind that one only wins by, like Brutus, killing your father figure. And the similarities to Freud, by the way, I mean, you've probably noticed, they shouldn't be ignored. I mean, in fact, when I think about passages like these, and sort of the undercurrent going on in these passages, I would even venture to say that Freud's Oedipus Complex may have found more inspiration from Nietzsche um, than maybe is even widely known, right? Uh, Nietzsche's own meditations on what it meant for him to kill his father, so to speak, to get beyond the old paternal relationship between his father figure and himself and really and truly determine his own path in life. Perhaps that is a perpetual or a repeating struggle that most of us have to face in our lives. But I love the end of the passage because it emphasizes that element of freedom that I think is really the core of Nietzsche's value as educator. And so with that, um, that's the passage Schopenhauer's followers, uh, getting free of Schopenhauer, getting free of Wagner. And uh, I think even though it's sort of a long and somewhat complex passage, we've made it pretty clear. So we, I think we can move on. Let's go to number 100, quote, learning to pay homage. Men have to learn to pay homage no less than to feel contempt. Anyone who breaks new paths, and who has led many others onto new paths, discovers with some amazement how clumsy and poor these people are in their capacity for expressing gratitude, and how rarely gratitude achieves expression at all. It almost seems that whenever gratitude wants to speak, she begins to gag, clears her throat, and falls silent before she has got out a word. The way in which a thinker gets some notion of the effects of his ideas, and of their transforming revolutionary power, is almost a comedy. At times, it seems, as if those who have felt this effect actually feel insulted, and as if they could express what they consider their threatened self-reliance only by bad manners. Whole generations are required merely to invent a polite convention for thanks, and it is only very late that we reach the moment when gratitude acquires a kind of spirit and genius. Uh, by then, there is usually also someone who becomes the recipient of great gratitude, not only for the good he himself has done, but above all for the treasure of what is best and highest that has been gradually accumulated by his predecessors. End quote. Uh, it's interesting because as uh, complex and in-depth and powerful as Aphorism 99 is, I find aphorism number 100 in the gay science to be very underwhelming. <laughs> because Nietzsche, by implication, I would say, uh, is talking about himself, right? Whenever we break new paths, when we innovate new ideas, we have to deal with the fact that people are clumsy and poor at expressing gratitude. And he says, when a thinker's ideas have some effect on society, the way that he gets some notion of his importance uh, is in the way that the people affected by his ideas respond with hostility. Or to put it in slightly different language, they respond with bad manners. It's almost a comedic in that way, because their response is so inappropriate. Um, their self-reliance, why do they do this? Their self-reliance is threatened by this person's ideas, because those ideas appear to have a transformative power, and if someone's ideas can come in and transform you, then you're no longer the self-reliant individual that you were. And so the passage in terms of the framing at the start and end is involved with this idea of how we might learn to express gratitude, which I suppose is in. in an interesting idea insofar as Nietzsche has been entertaining all of these um, sort of thought experiments about mankind as a growing being, as a living being, as a developing being, as a biological work in progress, a perpetual work in progress. The idea that every single element, every psychological phenomenon, every aspect of human nature, of the human condition, is something that we had to develop, that we had to create, that we had to come to. And this takes generations and generations. So on some level, we're just in that same territory, um, that all things human uh, have to be learned. And at first, it's clumsy and ill-mannered. Nietzsche then imagines at the end of the passage a sort of perfection of gratitude when it finally acquires spirit and recognizes those to whom it's due and so on. 
But there's not much more to say about this passage than this. And I think the implication is that Nietzsche would say of himself, and perhaps of his list of great thinkers generally, oh, all of our ideas are met with ingratitude. And perhaps in the future, they'll, they'll learn to be grateful for what I've taught them, right? Uh, and so with that, we'll move on uh, to 101, entitled Voltaire. Quote, Wherever there was a court, there were laws governing good speech, and thus also laws about style for all who wrote. But the language of the court is the courtier's language, and since he has no professional specialty, he does not permit himself, even in conversation about scientific matters, convenient technical expressions, for they smack of professional specialties. In countries of the courtly culture, technical expressions in anything that portrays a specialist are therefore considered stylistic blemishes. Now that every court has become a caricature of past and present, one is amazed to find even Voltaire incredibly prim and fastidious at this point. For example, in his judgments about such stylists as Fontenelle and Montesquieu. For all of us are now emancipated from courtly taste, while Voltaire perfected it, end quote. So as many of you may know, Voltaire, in spite of his legacy as a critic and a satirist and an advocate for freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and so on, basically all of what we would recognize as like uh, contemporary liberal democratic values, uh, in spite of all that, Voltaire, in terms of his class, is an aristocrat. He's a minor aristocrat, but he's he's part of high society nonetheless. The aristocracy of Britain and France really uh, enjoyed palling around with this cool satirist, you know, this guy who, in modern terms, would be understood as like a cool liberal social critic. So it's really nothing new. The upper class is uh, like rubbing elbows with those kinds of people. But what Nietzsche is pointing out uh, or what he's pointing to here as an aspect of Voltaire is that Nietzsche can almost forgive Voltaire's proto-liberalism in light of Voltaire's aristocratic manners. Uh, I say forgive because of Nietzsche's own political inclinations. And so Voltaire's position as a kind of court philosopher, the fact that he mastered the etiquette of the court, and the example he uses is that overly specialized language is bad manners. Why would that be? Because having a professional specialty is, is a blemish on your character in aristocratic circles. The true aristocrat is a person of leisure, uh, a person who has no professional specialties. Even if he has knowledge of some technical discipline or specialized field, the aristocrats, uh, it's, it's sort of like a uh, challenge to communicate to the court in such a way that all can understand what you're saying. That's just polite conversation. Right? And there's something to be said for that, actually, that if you can't say something without using jargon, without recourse to extremely specialized language, are you really capable of explaining it? If you're only capable of explaining something to someone who already understands it, is that really an explanation? And uh, I'll say as a communicator myself in this capacity, as a uh, podcaster, it's a real challenge sometimes to come up with ways to take complex ideas or ideas that are normally laced with jargon and frame them in a way that will still make sense just in terms of the general understanding that people have, right? Um, to use a concrete example, um, to bring an idea down to earth. And so Nietzsche asserts, this is part of Voltaire's judgments against, for example, Fontenelle, that no one mastered the courtly virtue as well as Voltaire did, of being a communicator, uh, someone, a writer who doesn't write in shibboleths, but can give us, well, um, aphorisms, right? Sayings, wisdom that can be learned by heart, so to speak. And so Voltaire is admirable because he's a master of good speech according to the rules of the noble courts of his era. And that's what produced this, frankly, liberal mind. And so uh, and whatever Nietzsche's opinions about aristocracy and liberalism, that in and of itself is a very interesting thing to consider. Let's go to uh, 102. Quote, a remark for philologists, that some books are so valuable and so royal that whole generations of scholars are well employed of their labors to preserve these books in a state that is pure and intelligible. Philology exists in order to fortify this faith again and again. It presupposes that there is no lack of those rare human beings, even if one does not see them, who really know how to use such valuable books, presumably those who write or could write books of the same type. I mean that philology presupposes a noble faith, that for the sake of a very few human beings, who always will come, but are never there, 
A very large amount of fastidious and even dirty work needs to be done first. All of it is work in usum delphinorum. Uh, end quote. And just Kaufman's footnote on that last phrase, uh, in or ad usum delphini, was originally an edition of Greek or Roman classics prepared especially for the Dauphine, the crown prince of France. Nietzsche uses the plural to refer, figuratively speaking, to future royalty, end quote. Um, this aphorism actually uh, kind of untied a knot for me, I remember, uh, back in the day, albeit kind of, I guess, an intellectual knot that I was only wrapped up in because of Nietzsche in the first place, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I mean, it was a, a, an epiphany moment for me in untangling Nietzsche's philosophy, because this passage addresses itself yet again to that question we considered in one of the sections last week, why do you write? The age-old question of why an author writes, why any philosopher philosophizes, but also the, the question of why Nietzsche, with his particular understanding of the world, feels the need to commit his ideas to the page. And uh, you could review last week's aphorisms or just uh, reread them in the gay science if you want a, a refresher on that. But I suppose where this passage was an epiphany moment for me was right at the question of culture and Nietzsche's work, particularly Nietzsche's whole understanding of what we're doing as human beings, what the project of civilization is, what the human condition means politically, socially, and artistically. And he sees this connection between politics and genius, between art and politics. And Nietzsche believes this connection was recognized going all the way back to Plato. The culture is a kind of shared experience of a number of perennial existential questions about human life, which transcend any one person's experience, but rather are repeated again and again. So these are impersonal questions. They're not personal to any person, or any not obviously to any person, but they're, they're not peculiar to any one individual. And usually what culture means is some sort of shared answer to these questions. And so those points of shared experience are, or at least intersect with valuations which are physiological demands for the preservation of a certain way of life. And so a culture, we could say in the grand scheme of things, preserves a modus vivendi, a way of life, by way of its values, which are, the values are sort of the ways, the, the side that you come down on when it comes to one of these perennial questions. And so what is the value then of a modus vivendi or uh, of a way of life? Why does culture establish this? Why is this necessary to us? Well, that uh, it's because cultures produce, at least occasionally produce, geniuses, extraordinary individuals, or an extraordinary talent or spirit incarnated in sometimes a rather flawed and ordinary person. But nonetheless, these are the artists who are, are like the force of becoming on culture, which continually adapt and transform it. Uh, and so the state, as the thing that safeguards culture, is ultimately there to foster genius. Because by fostering culture, the genius is sort of like the fruit of culture. Um, it's both the means and the ends. It's the, the sort of the, the total meaning of what culture gives to us. And so all of this dovetails into Nietzsche's understanding of what we're doing in philology. And that's where we come to this passage, which is a remark addressed to the philologists. And that is, our entire discipline exists for the sake of a few human beings. Not necessarily the few that are capable of writing great books, but those few who will be in the position to read one of them and be transformed by it and enact the wisdom within it. How many people will read Marcus Aurelius over the long course of history? Countless millions. How many people will read Marcus Aurelius and actually be in a similar political position to Marcus Aurelius, right? Uh, somebody with millions of lives in their hands. If a person like that reads Marcus Aurelius, then he can have a real effect on society. I mean, it certainly had a great effect on society when Emperor Ashoka read the Buddhist sutras, for example. And so we philologists, those who translate old texts and continue and transmit the knowledge of them and how to read them, what they mean in their context and the history of how these texts have been read and so on and so forth. That's for the sake of the few people who might read them and transform history because of them. The, the legislators of values, the philosophers, the artists, the statesmen. And really, one of the lessons we should take here is that maintaining the ability to read ancient texts, that's not just something that just happens, right? Uh, we think, okay, we made a translation. Well, now we, we've preserved that text. But you have to actively maintain your relationship within a given linguistic tradition or it's going to disappear. I mean, languages change and evolve over the years. None of us alive... Uh, speak Old English as our native language anymore. So if the discipline of philology disappeared tomorrow, or to put this in modern terms, if one day we just stop bothering to produce new translations of the classics, 
and we stop teaching new generations how to translate these languages and to read these texts, and we stop teaching them the background of the texts and so on. Well, by the time that English then develops to the point that none of our current published works is in the modern tongue anymore. Like, in other words, when when English evolves to the point that English today is considered in the future to be as incomprehensible as old English is to us, by that time, the knowledge of the classics will have been lost. You, you have to keep translating and retranslating. You have to keep transmitting and retransmitting the knowledge to new generations. It's not enough to just write it down and, and think it'll be comprehensible for all time. Comprehensibility of a text is something that has to be maintained, as Nietzsche says, with a, a, a very large amount of fastidious and even dirty work. Uh, it's tedious and unglamorous work, basically. And so the discipline of philology, the, the active maintenance of our communication with the ancient world, why does it exist? Why all of this collective effort? So that in so many words, an emperor, or in modern terms, a president might one day read Marcus Aurelius, or read Cicero, or Montaigne, or Nietzsche, for that matter. So uh, that to me is a very interesting insight, and I think it was just worth going into, you know, uh, the details of what it actually takes to maintain our ability to actually read texts from the ancient world. We we all have access to them today, but to ensure that future generations do, it actually takes active work to maintain, uh, just like maintaining infrastructure or any other thing in civilization. It all takes constant vigilance and maintenance. So um, let's move on. Now, I, I'm going to gloss over these next passages, actually, from 103 through 105, because they're all very wordy. They're all on the topic of the Germans. Uh, we have a criticism of German music. We have a criticism of the German language. And we have a criticism of uh, German artists, which ends up being, by extension, a criticism of German passions. Uh, why am I skipping over these aphorisms, basically? Well, because there's not much here that's philosophically fecund, to put it politely to Nietzsche. I mean, to put it impolitely, these sections are just not that relevant to us. And uh, it's, it's perhaps fitting, because it's passages like these when Nietzsche is most timely, and it's when Nietzsche is most timely that he strikes us as most irrelevant <laughs> to our own concerns. It's when Nietzsche is at his, his most untimely that he's at his best. And he knew that. So, But nevertheless, he wanted to establish himself as sort of a critic of the contemporary German culture. Sometimes he was distracted by the issues of his own day the cultural malaise he saw around him, and he wanted to somehow affect the zeitgeist. I think that was probably a weakness uh, on his part, and I think he did his best to resist it, but, you know, sometimes he, he gave in. But in any case, for those of us who do not live in the world of German music of the 1880s, for example, or who are not speaking and reading and writing in the German language of the 1880s, these criticisms will kind of, uh, they're going to be meaningless to you. And basically all you need to know about these sections is that these critiques are just they're, they're standard Nietzschean attacks on the German culture. German culture is barbaric, buffoonish, clumsy. Uh, basically, it's something unformed. It's patchwork. It hasn't come into its own. Uh, and the Germans have a superiority complex in spite of this, in spite of the fact that all the cultures around them have produced far more of artistic or intellectual value. They have all of these naive metaphysical and moral prejudices that they're constantly projecting onto other people and seem incapable of seeing the value of perspective. And uh, it just, it goes on and on. And so just to gloss through these, uh, in 103, the section on German music, uh, I'll paraphrase, Nietzsche makes a criticism that's repeated elsewhere. German music is a corruption of culture. It's corrupting the, the rest of European music. The Germans know how to excite the masses. They know how to portray ordinary people. They know how to infuse morality into their compositions which is always to the delight of the people. And finally, the decline of melody, as Nietzsche sees it, can be blamed on the Germans as well. And the, the decline of melody is perhaps the most interesting critique he makes because he ties it to a kind of uh, after effect of the revolution. Uh, and he says that melody is an inherently lawful thing that is at least perhaps uh, psychologically tied to order. And thus its decline represents a new disdain for the old order. And this could be interesting to consider in light of what musicians are today calling the death of melody in modern popular music. Uh, to go to 104, the summary is even more straightforward than this. I mean, in so many words, the German language is just ugly. It just sounds acoustically ugly. And it's being made worse, as Nietzsche says. Back in the day, the Germans, they adapted to the courtly language as well. Remember what Nietzsche says about Voltaire, that that seems to be sort of a, a benefit to the, the language or to the culture at large. But 
the language is being militarized and the, the coarseness and vulgarity of the way a Prussian officer speaks is infecting the whole culture. Everyone's speaking this way now, is what Nietzsche says. And that's certainly interesting for the purposes of showing that Nietzsche is not simply blindly pro-militarist in all things, as many people like to pretend he is. Both people who advocate for militarism and against it like to portray Nietzsche that way. Uh, it's quite obvious that militarism and language is an ugly thing, right? Uh, say what you will about the military. They're, they're not... Aesthetics is not really part of it. I mean, maybe it is to some extent. I mean, you know, there's military parades and things like that. But overall, functionality uh, is going to trump everything else in the military and doing things cheaply <laughs> as well. And the, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say the most efficient way. Anyone who's been in the military knows better than that. But um, the way one communicates in the military is, is really the very opposite of the way a poet might communicate. And like, I don't think anyone would say that the style of a military dispatch should be adopted by the broader culture as sort of the, you know, as, as like the zenith of what cultured writing is. Uh, so, you know, and Nietzsche's way of communicating is obviously far closer to that of the poet. Uh, finally, in 105, Nietzsche suggests a kind of stunted nature to German passion, which wishes to express itself. And like all of us have this, Nietzsche says, sort of sylvan nymphs within us who would like to dance and move and be joyful and vital. But that nature is trapped in these sort of rigid, bear-like people of the Germans. Uh, and uh, he also says it's far more common that they uh, have the goodwill to have the appearance of a passion or uh, the effects of a passion rather than uh, actually stirring the passions. And, you know, these stereotypes about the Germans exist to this very day, if you compare them to, say, Southern Europeans, right? The, the passionate people of Europe. Uh, Germans are known for being the opposite of that, and so that seems to hold true in Nietzsche's time as well. So we'll move on and cover the final two aphorisms of Book Two, continuing and concluding the theme on art. This is 106. Quote, Music as an advocate. I am thirsting for a composer, said an innovator to his disciple who would learn my ideas from me and transpose them into his language. That way I should reach men's ears and hearts far better. With music one can seduce men to every error and every truth. Who could refute a tone? Then you would like to be considered irrefutable, said his disciple. The innovator replied, I wish for the seedling to become a tree. For a doctrine to become a tree, it has to be believed for a good while. For it to be believed, it has to be considered irrefutable. The tree needs storms, doubts, worms, and nastiness to reveal the nature and strength of the seedling. Let it break if it is not strong enough, but a seedling can only be destroyed, not refuted. When he had said that, his disciple cried impetuously, but I believe in your cause, and consider it so strong that I shall say everything, everything that I still have in my mind against it. The innovator laughed in his heart and wagged a finger at him. This kind of discipleship, he said then, is the best." but it is also the most dangerous, and not every kind of doctrine can endure it, end quote. So we could take this to refer to the character of the innovator. Could really mean any kind of innovator, I suppose, but uh, let's make it specific. Let's think about it as a philosopher and his student, which I think is what is meant here. The philosopher wishes for a composer to spread his philosophical ideas. He expresses that to his student. Uh, that will make my ideas irrefutable. So that's an unusual idea in and of itself. It's fascinating because it's often said that what, what uh, Wagner wanted out of Nietzsche was just the reverse. Wagner was a composer who had a musical movement that he felt could be served by finding a philosophical advocate who translated the cultural movement behind his music into explicit, articulated philosophical terms. Obviously, it's it's kind of funny because Wagner's already taking Schopenhauer's philosophy and putting it to music and then translating it back into philosophy through Nietzsche. That seems to have been his goal. And so it could easily work both ways. Um, I, I mean, I guess you could say Wagner's music is already the act of putting Schopenhauer to music, but Nietzsche could then express Wagner's movement in the modern context as a cultural critic. And that's basically the role that Nietzsche sees himself playing during the untimely meditations, as we already mentioned. Uh, and so, again, it leads us to wonder if Nietzsche perhaps had the thought, once he'd broken from Wagner, I should find my own composer to put my philosophy to music, so to speak. And with the thought that music, art, uh, has the power to make one's ideas seem irrefutable. 
by seducing us the way that poets seduce us, the way rhythm compelled even the gods in the Greek worldview, the way Terpander or Empedocles used music to enchant or to transform the emotional states of other people, or the way that Nietzsche says even our modern theoretical skeptics are still susceptible to the error of treating a sentiment as true merely because it was expressed in a beautiful and poetic way. Um, so this is one way to spread the seeds of one's philosophy, to make people feel it as an irrefutable truth, as a truth that, it, that worms its way into our intuition, we might say. But the disciples' response is to say, I shall, out of loyalty to your doctrine, attack it in every way possible. Um, he's basically proposing a, a, a counterplan in a way. And this, the innovator says, is the best kind of discipleship, but not every doctrine is strong enough for it. Because, as we all know, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. A belief isn't weakened by weathering attacks and criticisms. It's strengthened by it. And so this points at a completely opposite way of understanding the spread of ideas. Um, paradoxically, by criticizing it, you might spread the idea or you might make the idea stronger. So it's either by the productive tension of the intellectual battlefield or it's by the seduction of art that an idea can become irrefutable. The seduction, particularly music, which is the most powerful art for winning hearts and minds in this way, for uh, bypassing one's rational, uh, might we say, defense mechanisms, finding its way straight into the, the feelings, the impulses. And so with that, we'll move on to the final section of book two, the end of the section of, or this book of the gay science, and that's number 107. And I think it's a beautiful recapitulation of the major points of this book that ties it together with some of the meditations that were begun all the way at the beginning of book one. So uh, let's, you know, bring it home for us, Nietzsche. Quote, our ultimate gratitude to art. If we had not welcomed the arts and invented this kind of cult of the untrue, then the realization of general untruth and mendaciousness that now comes to us through science, the realization that delusion and error are conditions of human knowledge and sensation, would be utterly unbearable. Honesty would lead to nausea and suicide. But now there is a counterforce against our honesty that helps us to avoid such consequences. Art as the goodwill to appearance. We do not always keep our eyes from rounding off something and, as it were, finishing the poem. And then it is no longer eternal imperfection that we carry across the river of becoming. Then we have the sense of carrying a goddess and feel proud and childlike as we perform this service. As an aesthetic phenomenon, existence is still bearable for us. And art furnishes us with eyes and hands, and above all the good conscience, to be able to turn ourselves into such a phenomenon. At times, we need a rest from ourselves by looking upon, by looking down upon, ourselves, and, from an artistic distance, laughing over ourselves or weeping over ourselves. We must discover the hero, no less than the fool, in our passion for knowledge. We must occasionally find pleasure in our folly, or we cannot continue to find pleasure in our wisdom. Precisely because we are at bottom grave and serious human beings, really, more weights than human beings, nothing does us as much good as a fool's cap. We need it in relation to ourselves. We need all exuberant, floating, dancing, mocking, childish, and blissful art, lest we lose the freedom above things that our ideal demands of us. It would mean a relapse for us with our irritable honesty to get involved entirely in morality and for the sake of the over-severe demands that we make on ourselves in these matters to become virtuous monsters and scarecrows. We should be able also to stand above morality and not only to stand with the anxious stiffness of a man who is afraid of slipping and falling at any moment, but also to float above it and play. How then could we possibly dispense with art and with the fool? As long as you are in any way ashamed before yourselves, you do not yet belong with us. End quote. So the ending is a reiteration of the idea that science has revealed the mendaciousness and short sightedness of all man's truths hitherto. It's one of the running themes of the book. This book can be understood as a kind of reframing, therefore, of the problem of science, the problem that Nietzsche established back in Birth of Tragedy, which is this problem which is ushered in by Socrates 
and by the theoretical approach to life. Knowledge kills action, as we, we've talked about earlier in this episode. That's another aspect of birth of tragedy. And the Socratic approach to life raises doubts. It uh, undermines. It makes things questionable. It throws into the realm of debate all of the most sacred values and beliefs. But if we continue to follow this scientific, inquisitive approach to life, the, the way of life that always seeks the truth as the highest good, we eventually reach that place, post-enlightenment, that even calls into question the value of truth. Or, uh, you know, rather, the, at the very least, the value of truth for us as living beings. The, the problem that we do not live in an imminent relationship with the truth. We live in a world mediated by sense impressions. We don't know the world as such. We know the world as we represent it, as it appears to us. And you know, that our very intellectual and dialectical capacities are not even aimed at the discovery of the truth, but they're aimed at, rather, survival, advantage, domination. And so the embarrassment that comes, the knowledge of our own folly that comes with the pursuit of truth is part of that problem of science. Uh, and so the undermining of that naive form of realism that Nietzsche addressed in the first aphorisms of book two, the veiled image, right? The just so realist position that we might associate today with the correspondence theory of truth or with some iteration or another of the correspondence theory, be it objectivism or scientific realism or whatever. There are religious versions of this worldview as well, right? But a, a truly serious empirical understanding of what kind of beings we are um, not so much about how the world is. I mean, I guess it, that's involved, but really what kind of beings we are, understanding that reveals that the truth in that sense of an objective mind independent reality is forever alien from us. The truth for us is not that kind of truth. The naive realist position therefore has to be abandoned. The naive belief in the re reliability of the senses and the correspondence of our representations to some Numinal reality that we really are not justified in making any claims about at all. And so again, from Nietzsche's notes, the age of the 19th century, the post-romantic period, is more honest and more gloomy. And Nietzsche uses here, in this passage, in the gay science, the language of honesty, and says that this honesty about our true situation as human beings would lead to nausea and suicide. And you know, there's that Kierkegaard quote um, that he says, you know, if the, the world were for certain only a place of like chaotic ferment of unthinking forces of which, you know, everything is only an, an accident. You know, if the world was not a creation of a loving intelligence, if we're not sparks of some sort of divine being with free will, if we're just an accidental consciousness within the royal of forces, right? I'm, I'm paraphrasing greatly here, but that's the thrust of the passage. Well, Kierkegaard says, if that were true, the only thing left for us in that world would be despair. And is that so different from, from Nietzsche's understanding of the world? You know, the, the, is that so different from what Nietzsche says the world actually is, right? That the sciences have uncovered. That's the basis on which Nietzsche would make that claim. That uh, out in some remote corner of the universe, amongst innumerable star systems, poured out and glittering against the backdrop of the cosmos, there was once a planet on which clever animals invented knowledge. That was the most audacious moment of world history, but only a moment, for within a few breaths the star went cold and the clever animals had to die. That's uh, me paraphrasing from memory the beginning of On Truth and Lies, but Nietzsche is effectively describing the very world that Kierkegaard says would be nothing but a cause for despair. But that's exactly the world that Nietzsche thinks science has uncovered. Or uh, we might even specify the caveat, uncovered for us. And so that is what is meant by perishing from our honesty before the face of this awful truth. And so what is our ultimate gratitude to art, as the passage is entitled? It is the fact that art has prepared us for the prospect that delusion and untruth are inseparable from the human condition, inseparable from all our beliefs about reality, even. The cult of the untrue, as Nietzsche calls it, that's what's been fostered by art, which means that through art, we have developed a desire for untruth, and therefore, in the face of the truth, we have recourse to art as a means not to perish. Art is the goodwill to appearance. What does this mean? Well, we might say lying, deception, right? That's considered malintent. But art, absorption in mere appearance in an aesthetic way, while no less of a mere deception than any other falsehood, that's considered a good. It's considered one of the great pleasures of life. 
So one of our greatest pleasures is to let ourselves be deceived, to let ourselves be tricked by mere appearance. And so we have this counterforce now to oppose the all-encompassing, scientific, skeptical, Socratic honesty that wants the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Now we've developed the goodwill to say no, not all the time. And sometimes I might require a lie. I might require an artistic modification or reframing of reality in order to endure existence. And so the final note of the passage then is to bring us back to that gay seriousness that's being cultivated throughout the text. The invitation to take a rest from looking at yourself from on a height. That's certainly something that might be a noble trait, right? A a trait of honest self-reflection that most people don't have the courage to engage in to take a step back from themselves and consider their lives from a distance. But for us who are perhaps too contemplative, perhaps too pensive and self-judgmental, maybe to a fault, it's good sometimes to take a rest from that and stop aspiring to be the hero. We should remember what Nietzsche uh, goes on to write in Eke Homo. I do not want to be a saint. I should rather be a clown. Or it could trans- you could translate it as, uh, I should rather be a buffoon. And that it's good, as Nietzsche says in this passage, to put on the fool's cap every once in a while. And to put this very vulgarly, uh, stop taking yourself so seriously, right? That's, That's really all he's saying. That the goal to recount the list of virtues we might call them that Nietzsche lists off is to become exuberant, floating, dancing, mocking, childish, blissful. Why? For its own sake exuberance, love of life, floating and dancing through life, that itself is a celebration of being alive. It's a self-conscious joy. That's the real gold of human life, of human experience. That's what we're all searching for in this existence, however long or short. And before Nietzsche has even written the parable of the camel, the lion, and the child, this invitation to become more childish is right here in the gay science. And so to become all of those things really and truly means being able to maintain that attitude even in respect to oneself. To be mocking and exuberant and playful when it comes to our own assessments of ourselves and our own character even. And so Nietzsche's new lease on life that he's trying to offer us is an emancipation, but not in the sense of, you know, you have some guilt, some deficiency, some problem that you need to fix, and then the weight can be lifted. No, Nietzsche says, as long as you're not ashamed of yourself, that's the goal. To stand above morality for artistic or aesthetic reasons, to be able to consider oneself, uh, one's life as a kind of story, as simply a series of experiences or memories that were either beautiful or ugly or exhilarating or boring or stressful or invigorating. It's just a series of sensations. And just like with a novel, our own lives, the story of our lives could be better or worse as such a narrative, aesthetically. Not, not morally, but aesthetically. And so to be able to be unashamed of our vices, to be able to stand above morality, even if we acknowledge the utility of morality, the reasons why it exists, the inability of man to live without it, but to say from an artistic perspective, my morality does not matter so much. Uh, in the same way that an evil character in a novel could be very compelling, could be a, an aesthetically beautiful character and a morally hideous character. The free individual, as Nietzsche said in that passage that he quoted from Untimely Meditations, has the right to be both good and evil, and probably will be both. Can we appreciate ourselves the way we might appreciate a good literary character, who is not a moral paragon, uh, who likely has all their flaws and vices, like all good literary characters, and recognize that all those aspects of ourselves are, in fact, intimately bound up with the totality of who we are? The good in us would not be there if not for all the evil in us. The so-called evil anyway, right? So how could we possibly dispense with art? How could we possibly dispense with this, this desire to enjoy the mere appearance at the expense of the honest-to-God truth? We require art so as not to perish of the truth. And while this book is definitely an incisive, skeptical, critical work, uh, very much in the tradition of the many seekers after truth that Nietzsche um, somewhat paradoxically criticizes, This book, at least, ends on this notion, book two ends on this notion, this recommitment that the philosopher of the future will not be an inartistic man in the mold of Socrates, that unlike Socrates and Plato, banishing the poet from the Republic, you know, because he's a liar and a manipulator and a dangerous force in society, Nietzsche says, no, we need this will to untruth, this will to be deceived, the will to stop at the appearance, 
and the ability to take a kind of sensuous pleasure in the appearance. That's one of Nietzsche's great discoveries in philosophy, which may seem so obvious to utter aloud, but how many philosophers completely ignored the sovereign unreason that is a core part of human life? Nietzsche embraces that unreason and here pays it gratitude. And with that, uh, I think we're done with book two of The Gay Science. We will return to this book after another eight episodes, and uh, we'll once we get back and hit book three, that's where we will begin running into some of the more, more uh, famous passages in Nietzsche's entire canon, really, not just in the gay science. Uh, Death of God aphorism, I believe the greatest weight aphorism is in book three. Uh, so I'm very excited for that. But at the moment, uh, the break from the read-through is welcome, because it means I get to step away from Nietzsche once again. And, uh, you know, it's just because I've read spent more time of my life reading Nietzsche than is probably decent uh, to do. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very excited to get back into other thinkers. And I think all of you will be very excited with who we're covering next. Uh, again, as I've said, we're going to take a week off. We'll have one of my personal episodes as well, the Wandering Above a Sea of Fog series, where it's more, more focused on me and my thoughts and my own life rather than on Nietzsche. Uh, and then after that, we'll return with some hard-hitting, rigorous philosophy. Hope you'll join me then. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.